Not Sergei Shaigu. Not Dmitry Medvedev. This woman is the most important person for Putin in Russia. When 17,500 economic, political, diplomatic, and social sanctions failed to knock Russia down, Russians honored her. It was she who steered Russia's economic ship through nearly 18,000 of the West's toughest sanctions. She has also been the main architect shaping the Russian economy for more than one decade. It was she who formulated the options to counter all economic and financial sanctions against Russia. Neither famous nor scandalous, this character does not have the eloquent speeches, the harsh statements of Dmitry Medvedev. Nor is it mentioned by the media as part of Russia's policy of the, two Sergeys, doctrine. But her appearance is a testament to a strong Russia, with the most incredible realities. Considered the steering of Russia's economic boat out of the most devastating economic disasters. She is the protector of Russia's economic fortress against the worst storm of sanctions in history. It was Elvira Nebialina, the hero in the shadows of Russia. Welcome to Battlecry. Economic Captain No special childhood, no life events, if you are looking for a feminist representative with old maxims, come to Hollywood. And if you want to know what a deep river is, ripe rice bows, come to Nebialina. Born in 1963 in Bashkiria, an autonomous Soviet Republic within the Soviet Union and later Russia. If you see her for the first time, you will feel that she is a monotonous person, rarely see her express her feelings in speeches or interviews. But it's not boredom, it's frightening calmness in the face of the toughest adversities. Elvira Nebialina, head of the Central Bank of Russia, CBR, since 2013, is credited with strengthening the ruble and Russia's defenses against global sanctions. Two times steering Russia's economic boat out of the apocalyptic scenario, is the rare person who personally makes Russian President Vladimir Putin humble himself for help. The wave of sanctions created by the West became strangely normal in her eyes. Nebialina was tasked with steering the Russian economy through the deep recession and keeping the country's financial system afloat. She helped the Russian currency recover spectacularly, after losing a quarter of its value just days after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24. The Central Bank of Russia, CBR, has taken active measures to prevent large amounts of money from leaving the country, panic in the markets and a potential flight of the banking system. During the last crisis, she turned disaster into opportunity. In 2014, Russia was rocked by two economic shocks slumping oil prices, due to soaring U.S. production and Saudi Arabia's refusal to cut production, that decimated oil revenues, and waves of economic sanctions following Russia's annexation of Crimea. The ruble fell sharply. Nebialina has abandoned traditional policies, such as setting aside large amounts of foreign currency reserves to support the exchange rate, shifting the CBR's focus to managing inflation. She raised interest rates to 17% and kept them relatively high for years. But by mid-2017 she had managed to bring the inflation rate down below 4%, the lowest level in the post-Soviet era. Under Nebialina's direction, CBR continues its modernization efforts. It has improved its ability to communicate, provide guidance on policy, meet with analysts, and send interviews with reporters. The CBR is considered the country's key economic brain, attracting reputable economists from the private sector. At its annual conference in St. Petersburg, the CBR attracted economists from around the world. In addition to her track record on monetary policy, Nebialina has received praise for pursuing a comprehensive purification of the banking sector. If Putin is the one who recovers resources for Russia from oligarchs, Nebialina is the one who turns those resources into rubles. Because bread simply won't come naturally to the people, guns won't come naturally to the military. If resources are not used properly, Putin's Russia could well go down Yeltsin's path to starve to death on its own resources. In her first year at the CBR, she revoked about 400 banking licenses, closed one-third of Russian banks, and eliminated weak institutions with suspicious transactions. This was considered a brave crusade. In 2006, a CBR official was assassinated after initiating an aggressive campaign to close banks suspected of money laundering. Sergei Guriev, a Russian economist who is now a professor at Sciences Po in Paris, said, Fighting corruption in the banking sector is the work of very courageous people. 
Navy Alina was a senior official in Putin's administration for two decades. She was his chief economic advisor for more than a year before being appointed CBR president in June 2013. She also served as economic development minister during Putin's time as prime minister. Sofia Donetsk, in Moscow, said, she is very respected in the government. In recent years, policy questions in the financial sector have been entrusted to the CBR. That belief has been built as Navialina works to shore up Russia's economy in the face of Western sanctions, particularly from long-term U.S. penalties. In 2014, the U.S. excluded many large Russian companies from its capital markets. To make companies and banks less vulnerable if Washington further restricts the country's access to the use of dollars, she has shifted the bank's reserves worth more than $600 billion into gold, the euro and the yuan. During her tenure, although the share of dollars in the CBR's reserve fund fell to about 11 percent, from more than 40 percent due to sanctions freezing the CBR's overseas reserves, Russia still had enough reserves in gold and yuan. Other safeguards against sanctions include alternatives to SWIFT, global banking messaging system, changes to the payment infrastructure to process credit card transactions in the country. Recent Western sanctions have forced her to abandon her preferred policies. Instead, Navialina doubled interest rates, to 20 percent, imposed capital controls to curb the flow of money out of Russia, closed the stock market and eased regulation of banks. These measures stopped the initial panic and helped the ruble recover. That recovery, combined with years of preparations in all other areas, has turned the tide from the second half of 2023. At the beginning of 2023, there are already forecasts that the Russian economy could shrink by as much as 10 percent or default. Countless scenarios have been raised. But that number has dwindled over time from 10 percent to 0.2 percent by the end of the year, and then to 2.4 percent by the end of the year. With 17,500 sanctions and some $285 billion frozen abroad, Putin confidently declares that it is not yet time for the Russian people to choose bread on the table, or guns for the front lines. Many Western officials and media predicted that the Russian economy would collapse under the pressure of sanctions and military spending, but later had to admit that Moscow had overcome gloomy forecasts. Meanwhile, the economies of the G7 countries, which did not participate in the war, declined at an alarming rate. Britain, for example, has fallen into recession and the EU as a whole is gloomy with growth yet to surpass 1%. This is an unprecedented event in the history of the world economy. Economic Fortresses As I said above, bread will not come naturally to the people, guns will not naturally reach the army. In fact, to steer the Russian boat out of apocalyptic scenarios like the beginning of 2023, only to have a spectacular turnaround in the last six months of the year. It was not a miracle but an effort and preparation over the years before. Navy Alina has prepared three layers of backdrops for the Russian economy, both able to withstand and counter sanctions. Let's first start with the name SWIFT. In fact, in March 2022, when the US and Europe excluded Russian banks from the SWIFT payment system, no distortion was seen on Navialina's face. Because she has been preparing for this scenario since 2014, we often hear a lot about the horror of being excluded from the SWIFT system. But the truth is that this is only true for small countries and doing so is also a double-edged sword. Since 2014 Russia has developed its own payment system called SPFs, in fact China and India also have their own payment systems such as China has SIPs, India has SFMS. Although these systems cannot achieve transactions as huge as SWIFT, they still ensure business with important partners of a country. Currently, 159 foreign partners from 20 countries have joined the Russian system, which is too small compared to SWIFT's 200 countries. But one thing that the press rarely mentions is that excluding a country from this system will also cause businesses doing business with that country to be affected. We've heard about the US and EU excluding Russia from the SWIFT payment system, but they forget to say that they have just excluded seven Russian financial banks, while Russia has more than 300 of them, the second most after the US. And as of July 2023, Razakaz Bank, one of seven Russian banks excluded from SWIFT, has been readmitted. The reason is that they need to trade with Russia and no one will criticize the economic pie for doing business with them. This also comes from the next key layer of restructuring of the Russian economy, 
Its own payment system is not the only thing Russia uses to counter the United States over the West. We hear a lot about the number of embargoes reaching 17,500, but have you ever read carefully what those embargoes are? In fact, most of these sanctions target individual Russians who are barred from entering the United States and some of their allies. There are even yes and no sanctions, like freezing foreign assets of Russian officials. But they couldn't find any of their assets overseas. Although Western media say Putin has nearly $200 billion in private wealth hidden abroad, so do his other close officials. In 2014 and 2022, when sanctions and asset freezes on key figures in the Russian regime were announced, the West failed to find any such assets. In 2015, when interviewed by journalists about freezing foreign assets, then-presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov put it this way, Since I am also quite absent-minded, I would be very grateful if they found out what money I had sent abroad without remembering it. Despite the 17,500 sanctions, it stayed away from Russian exports. The reason is simply that Russia is restructured with a manufacturing economy, whose products serve the most basic needs of life and industry. Specifically in five areas, food, fertilizer, chemicals, heavyweight, raw ore. They have always occupied a huge market share in the world. For example, currently 20% of the world's fertilizer is produced in Russia, and you may not know that despite the fight over the forehead, Russia is the second largest fertilizer exporter to the US and the largest to Europe. Russia's wheat exports now account for 25% of the world. That's not to mention essential materials for key industries, such as noble gases for semiconductor chips, which account for half of the world, and so on. Not only that, in other industries from wood to diamonds, precious stones of all minerals, the top 10 always has the name of Russia. This paints the reality that isolating Russia from the world is a distant dream. And the reality is that they are trying to circumvent their own sanctions in order to buy Russian goods. Frankly, without the current Western sanctions, we probably wouldn't know how important Russia is to the world. For more than 10 years of rebuilding the manufacturing economy, many thought it was a futile effort, until Russia's retaliation was unleashed. From the COVID-19 pandemic to the current embargo, it was expected that Russia would experience a severe shortage of civil goods, due to the inability to produce. But then how about Russia's economy not being disrupted by the disruption of global supply chains when COVID-19 broke out and they were not affected by sanctions on the contrary, when sanctions were pushed to their peak and in fact nothing more, we suddenly realized that the world cannot live without Russia. The third is the amount of Russian foreign assets that are frozen. The exact current figure of $300 billion that has been held in the countries of the Group of Seven, G7, industrialized countries, the EU and Australia. In her end of 2023 statements, Nabialina said it was a thorny issue but insisted Russia would not lose its assets. Basically, Russia is currently unable to use this huge reserve, but it is not losing it either. Although the press has repeatedly made headlines that the G7 will spend that money on aid in reconstruction of Ukraine, in reality this is almost impossible. The reason is that there is currently no official law that allows them to do that, unless they want to tear up the law and play the law of the jungle. But even in that case, Russia will not sit idly by. The fact that $300 billion of Russian assets are frozen is well known. But one fact that is rarely mentioned in the press is that Russia also holds $288 billion in European assets in its own country. Why? Why do they have so many? A little known fact is that in two years of fighting chipped heads and there were more than 17,500 sanctions against Russia. Britain's largest oil company, BP, still owns an 11% stake in Rosneft, Russia's largest oil company, and billions of dollars in dividends from its operations. And BP isn't the only one. European assets in Russia are mainly factories, companies, stocks, etc. Things that are making money for parent companies. For example, currently the five largest EU investors include Cyprus, $98.3 billion, the Netherlands, $50.1 billion, Germany, $17.3 billion, France, $16.6 billion, Italy, $12.9 billion. In addition, the UK and Switzerland are also worth tens of billions of dollars in Russia. Even the US figure is up to $9.6 billion. When G7 meetings began to discuss Russia's $300 billion in assets being frozen, 
Just hours later, RFI reported that Russia would seize assets of the EU, G7, Australia and Switzerland in the Russian economy, reaching $288 billion, if Western countries seized Russian assets. And while the G7 and the EU are talking backwards, Russia has come first. In July 2023, President Vladimir Putin signed a decree imposing temporary control of the Russian state over the foreign shares of the big boys. Soon after, more than 83 million shares of Danone Russia owned by Prodwitz Ladies Phrase Est Europe were transferred control to the state. Danone's business in Russia includes 13 factories, 7,200 employees and accounts for 5% of the French food company's annual global turnover of about $27 billion. You understand why the G7 and the EU have not come to an agreement. The law is not possible, but the law of the jungle is not. As the saying goes, no one in this world gives nothing. Is Ukraine worth trading its status, prestige and $288 billion in assets? I think you guys have the answer themselves. And then, on February 27 and 28, 2024, the meeting between the finance ministers of the G7 and G20 came to a final result. French finance minister Bruno Le Maire said similar moves should comply with international law and the support of G20 members Russia, China and non-US allies. Or, to put it bluntly, there is no way to confiscate this property. All three layers of stoppers, rigorously designed by Elvira Nabialina over the years, have helped Russia overcome its darkest apocalyptic scenarios and still thrive in adversity. In her more than 10 years of steering Russia's economic boat, she has not had as much media presence as Medvedev, nor as much global attention as Putin. She is an unsung Russian hero, or as the saying goes, behind a successful man there is always a woman, but in this case it was an entire country.